Good morning and good afternoon and welcome to today's National Hog Farmer webinar, Needle Know-How. This webinar is brought to you by the National Pork Board. My name is Kevin Schultz, Senior Staff Writer with National Hog Farmer, and I will be your moderator today. In a moment, I will be turning things over to our speakers, but first, let me explain how you can get the most out of this event. To improve your viewing and listening experience, you can move your webcast windows around by dragging on the title bar or resize them by clicking on their lower right corner. At the bottom of your screen, you'll find multiple application widgets. A copy of today's slide deck is available for download in the green resource list widget. The logos you see on your console, including the National Pork Board logo, are hyperlinked. If at any point during this event you would like to visit the corresponding website, you can click on any logo and a new window will open. This will not take you out of the webinar. We welcome questions about our topic and we'll answer as many as we can following the presentation. But feel free to submit yours to the queue at any time. Just type it into the Q&A window on the left-hand side of your screen and hit the Submit button. Please also be aware that today's session is being recorded and will be available for on-demand viewing. You'll be notified by email when the archive is available. Now let me introduce today's speakers. Karen Hoare is the Director of Producer Learning and Development at the National Pork Board, where she provides support for the association's information and education programs. Dr. Jeff Bender is a professor in the School of Public Health an adjunct professor in the University of Minnesota College of Veterinary Medicine. And Dr. C. Scanlon Daniels, DVM, MBA, has been a production veterinarian with Iowa Select Farms in Iowa Falls, Iowa, and Seaboard Farms in Guyman, Oklahoma. Currently, Dr. Daniels is owner and founder of Circle H Headquarters, LLC. You can find more information about our speakers by clicking on the speaker bio widget at the bottom of your screen. With that, let's get started. Karen, the floor is yours. Good afternoon and thank you, Kevin. Um, thank you everybody for joining us today and thanks to the National Hog Farmer for hosting this webinar. Um, I'm gonna kick things off with an overview of needle know-how and needle know-how concept uh, where it came from what it is and what to expect from the National Port Board over the next year. So how do we get to where we are today? So many of you may remember that in the early part of this century, and that's 2000, for those of you like me who still get confused by that, um, the National Port Producers Council launched the One is Too Many campaign. Um, there was a food safety awareness campaign that really was to tackle the issue of broken needles. Uh, while there's little data currently available um, to accurately track the incident today, anecdotally, still 15 plus years later, we're still dealing with the risk of a broken needle reaching the finished pork product. Um, so while the risk is small, um, especially considering the number of injections that could be given across the industry on an annual basis, the impact to the, in of the, um, to the industry on one needle reaching the consumer or the retailer um, could be far-reaching and significant. Um, it would impact markets, it impacts consumer trust. So last year, the National Port Board collaborated with the National Hog Farmer again to present a webinar on broken needles that we called How to Prevent Broken Needles, Protecting People, Pigs and Pork. Now that webinar is archived, so if anybody missed that, I highly recommend you go and check that out. It's available for viewing from the National Hog Farmer uh, website. And then secondly, this last year, the National Pork Board has been working with producers, packers, and allied industry to better understand the issue today and to identify ways to prevent occurrences at all different stages of production. So in January, a group of producers, packers, allied industry representatives, and other stakeholders, we all met together at the International uh, Production and Processing Expo in Atlanta to better understand the issue from all perspectives, um, to identify ways to reduce the incidence of broken needles and just make sure we can keep those markets. So some of the outcomes of that, uh, that multi-stakeholder meeting led to ongoing work for us here at the Port Board. Um, that included things like collecting accurate information to actually quantify the issue. We really don't know what the, where the, what the problem is like today. We really don't know that for a fact. Um, we want to identify 
areas for future research. So what can we be looking at? And then investigating improved and alternative medication delivery systems, whether that be needle-free technology or whether that's different injection delivery systems. And then identifying ways to improve communication out and across all stages of the pork production process. What was one of the things that came out of that meeting that there's, a, there's sometimes an issue with communicating across to see where the problem is and, and getting the information back to the guy on the ground. And then, of course, developing and training educational um, materials for the worker so they understand the issue and, uh, and so that we can affect some behavioral change. So as the Director of Producer Learning and Development of the National Pork Board, my role in this initiative um, is to identify and develop training and education materials to help address this topic. Uh, we want to make sure that we meet the, res the resources, meet the needs of the animal caretakers, the guys on the ground, the guys doing the injections. So early on, we recognized that there are a few different audiences for this educational material, this educational information, um, some of whom we're not reaching effectively today with our current resources. So, for example, we've got vaccination crews in many organizations who may not be PQA plus certified. Um, they would probably need some more task-specific detailed information for it to be relevant to them, for them to understand it. And it's also critical that these vaccination crews and these employees not only understand the process, but also feel comfortable and confident when they, in dealing with a broken or reporting a broken needle if it occurs. Uh, so we've got to make sure that we really speak to those people. So with that in mind, uh, as we started to work on this initiative, it became apparent that while dealing with a broken needle issue, there's also an opportunity to expand the topic to include some more aspects of inject injectable treatment and medication administration. That's where the needle know-how came in. Uh, so the needle know-how program is kind of an umbrella program that covers all parts of the tasks of uh, treating and vaccinating. So the resources that we're going to be developing over the next year are going to focus on each of these different parts of the process and improve the skills, knowledge, and professionalism around the process. So the first resources um, available will be the Broken Needle Prevention, and they're going to be available on pork.org this fall, very, very shortly. I'd hope they would get up today or before today, but not, not made that happen yet, but pretty close to being done. Um, so then human safety will include preventing needle stick injuries, animal safety, and animal handling safety while treating and vaccinating. And Jeff is going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And then medication handling, focusing on proper storage, disposal of expired, excess med uh, medication, those types of things. Animal handling, in pro including proper animal restraint and care while injecting. Broken needle prevention, uh, that deals with obviously correct needle size, restraint, uh, reminders not to break. Uh, to straighten a bent needle, those key points. Then, of course, the broken needle reporting, it's going to provide resources that ensure that if a broken needle event occurs, all the steps are in place so that it does not reach um, the finished product, doesn't go to market. Administering injections, focusing on proper location, technique, and dosage, and then treatment recording um, it explains what, how, and why treatment recording is required and, and is completed. Um, so incorrect or missing treatment records are, for us are regularly a cause of points lost in the uh, common swine industry audit. So there's an opportunity for the industry to, uh, to show some improvement here. And then finally, um, the, training, the training resources will cover proper uh, needle medication uh, disposal. So needless to say, some of these elements overlap, um, but providing specific, you're going to find detailed information. Producers are going to be able to train on areas when they identify a problem, when there's an opportunity for improvement, and when risk is the highest. So like all our resources, the resources here are being developed in both English and Spanish and in formats that will allow flexibility. Um, so trainers can use uh, brief, short videos, PowerPoint presentations, handouts, and supplemental resources, um, such as S uh, standard operating procedures, SOPs, um, or broken needle reporting forms. Um, a, a flip book of one-page high points that we can laminate and use in the barn or the break room for just-in-time training or when a problem is identified. And you'll see potentially posters. I put a question mark behind that. Um, posters are generally less effective for actually improving behavior. They can be used to 
uh, as a tool to remind people about a topic, but it's the type of thing that you have to regularly review that and take it down um, so that employees don't become blind to the message. So in 20, oh, 2018 it is the uh, 10 year anniversary of We Care. And so while many in the industry are working to reignite the awareness of pork producers' commitment to the ethical principles, we're also reigniting um, awareness of the challenge of broken needles and needle know-how and how it relates to each of the ethical principles. So we're preventing and, pro uh, re preventing and proper reporting of broken needles. Uh, that helps us to ensure our commitment to produce safe food. We protect and promote animal well-being when we restrain and handle animals properly. We're ensuring practices to protect public health uh, by using medications responsibly and recording treatments to prevent um, excessive residue. And then proper treatment, excuse me, proper disposal um, of needles and medications helps to safeguard our natural resources. And we're providing a work environment that's safe by reducing an instance of needle uh, stick and animal contact injuries. So on that note, I'm going to pass over to Dr. Bender to talk more about the safety element of needle know-how, um, some of the great work and the resources that uh, UMASH has on this issue. Great. Thanks, Karen. I really appreciate that. And also, uh, a special thanks to the National Pork Board as well as uh, uh, National Hog Farmers uh, for the opportunity to really address uh, this issue of needle stick injuries in swine workers. Um, uh, again, my name is Jeff Bender. I'm a veterinarian. I'm also the co-director for the Upper Midwest Agricultural Safety and Health Center. And, you know, we have a special interest, especially in uh, workers, their families, and protecting their health and safety. So um, let me start with a situation. So, for example, maybe one of your fellow coworkers comes to you and mentions that he just stuck himself with a needle containing a swine vaccine combination. And he asks you, is this a problem? And you might have a number of responses, and I, I will have a couple uh, as an example here. Uh, one, you say, uh, don't worry, it's for pigs, and it won't affect you. Um, or you might say, hmm, maybe you should get some antibiotics. Or another response could be, well, maybe you need to get a tetanus shot. Um, or the, the other option may be, well, I have no clue. Um, and if we ask just the general public about this, um, and, I, and I, if I could ask for a virtual raising of hands, probably D is uh, the response or most of the responses that we might get. So what I'd like to do is review really the limited data that we have on needle stick injuries, and these will include uh, published case reports, which are limited, also um, any available um, incidence data that we have. And then lastly, I'd like to provide really a quick overview of just some of the prevention recommendations. So as a reminder, the USDA licenses over 2,000 vaccines for animals, and many of those are actually um, live vaccines or modified live vaccines. The one thing to remember about veterinary vaccines is that they're intended for animals and not humans, and they're not tested for safety in humans. Um, the other issue is that sometimes humans do things that are not recommended, and they might use some of these veterinary vaccines or products for themselves. Uh, I'll give you a couple examples. One is that in the height of the West Nile virus uh, outbreak in the United States, uh, there was reported increased use of, of the vaccine, the veterinary vaccine in people, and then also uh, anecdotal reports of rodeo riders often using some of the anti-inflammatories uh, because of the injuries they would sustain during rodeos uh, would be a couple examples of intentional administration. So, uh, you know, we are potentially exposed either accidentally or intentionally to some of these products. So, are needle stick injuries a problem on swine operations? Um, they are, um, and they're common. Uh, in varying surveys, uh, we've actually noted how common they are, and I just provide one one data point here or one study that sh uh, d documented that 80% of farmers that were using vaccines in animal agricultures had accidentally stuck themselves within the, that year, and so it's a pretty common uh, issue that does occur. And a reminder is that some of these can be serious. As an example, 
Uh, here is a thumb that has a necrosis or uh, uh, kind of a dissolving away of the tissue um, after an injection with actin actinobacillus pleuronomoniae, and this is 14 days after the inoculation. So these do occur. In looking at uh, the scientific literature um, several years ago, we identified um, a number of case reports. Most of these occurred in men, and most of these occurred in the working age men. Um, when they were asked the location of where these injuries occurs, you can um, obviously see that most of these occurred in the hands, um, some occurred in the legs, and others occurred in varying other parts of, of the body. Um, a number of them involved the oil adjuvant vaccines um, in some of these uh, products, which actually can cause a fairly significant um, inflammatory reaction um, if it is injection, injected. When looking a little bit more at these cases, we noted that these are cases that actually sought medical attention. So clearly that's why they were published in the medical reports, because they, got, they got seen. Um, a number of these individuals were actually hospitalized, and they were hospitalized for a number of days, uh, usually about a median of three days. Um, a number of these individuals required surgery, um, especially with those that were exposed to these oil adjuvant products or oil adjuvant vaccines. When asking or trying to determine a little bit of information about the outcome on these uh, uh, patients, 15 um, of 30 that we had information on made a complete recovery within a couple of weeks. There was one reported death, and there were a number of individuals that had residual sequelae. In other words, they had problems after, even after several weeks. Um, three individuals required multiple surgeries, were actually out of work for three to six months, and three workers were unable to return to work one year after the injury. And that's what makes this issue of significance is that this could actually impact your workforce um, if, uh, in a sense, a very preventable um, um, means or uh, methods can be done to try to alleviate the, this problem. But I want to remind folks that this is really just the tip of the iceberg when we look at injuries. What we see reported in the scientific literature is the very tip top of what those occur. We know that there are actually many injuries that are not reported or actually will seek medical care or might be minor and not actually um, be re um, mentioned to any of the management staff, so might not be even aware um, that that occurred. Um, when we looked at um, work uh, compensation indemnity claims in Minnesota, we noted that uh, between 2003 to 2011, there were 719 indemnity claims. Um, what that means is that these are people that actually weren't working. They were out of work for usually three days or more, and that actually was costing these swine workers here in Minnesota at least $3 million, and that doesn't include the medical costs. So this is actually, a very, again, a very small tip of the iceberg um, when we look at uh, injuries. To dig down a little deeper, we actually worked with um, a couple of large swine systems and looked at their uh, injury claims. And we noted that they had nearly 1,800 injury claims, costing them about $4.5 million. Medical costs were $1.3 million. Indemnity costs, and these are costs for people not coming to work, was $3.1 million. And when we looked at that, um, that data, a number of them actually had uh, reported uh, neolistic injuries, and they actually were quite common, um, but they don't really cost for probably the majority or a significant amount of those indemnity costs, but they were still there. They were still being recorded as an, as an injury, and it highlights that these injuries actually are quite common on operations. So before I actually get into um, the issue of precautions or recommendations, um, the thing just to really um, remember or to be reminded of is that needlestick injuries uh, are impactful, um, especially the workplace, and they can really uh, um, contribute to the, a problem, and they are preventable. And so that gets me to the next point of how do we prevent these, or what precautions should um, you take or our employees take? And the first is really just to slow down and don't rush. In a sense, be mindful of what we're doing. The second point is um, the need to have proper equipment and proper technique. And so um, some basic, uh, you know, 
common sense issues is don't, you know, uncap needles with your mouth. Um, dis uh, uh, don't discard or discard all your unused needles, um, making sure that, that uh, um, you not keep needles, especially used needles, in your pocket so that you um, can inject or uh, cause, cause accidental injections. Um, next is just to be aware of the products that uh, you need to take extra precautions with or should be aware of the potential risk associated with those products. And these include things like sedatives. It might be things that might be oil-based uh, products. As you as recall in uh, reported literature, the problem with oil-based um, vaccines. Also modified live vaccines, uh, hormones, especially for um, um, uh, women and pregnant women, um, and also the issue of antibiotic sensitivity uh, for some individuals. One of the uh, methods that can be employed, and this is in ideal situations, is the issue of the, the one-handed scoop method. And so this keeps your fingers away from the tip of the needle and hopefully will prevent a potential uh, needle stick injury. Now, sometimes that's not always real, and actually with uh, Dr. Scanlon's uh, presentation, we'll hear about some alternatives. The other is the need for um, approved Sharps containers. Um, ideally, we want to not let them overflow. Um, usually when they're three-quarters of the way full, we encourage that they be um, disposed of, but making sure that they're at eye level and that people can see them and people are using them. The other issue that we want our employees to be aware of is, is what happens or what should we do if we get stuck. Um, the first is just to stop what you're doing, to wash the wound with soap and water, and then to notify your supervisor um, as to uh, this and for them to be aware of should this be something of concern, should I refer this individual to a healthcare provider, um, what should be done. So as a, a summary of that, uh, a couple of management practices that are, are recommended or specific management, management practices is really the need to train employees about safe needle handling, um, safe injection procedures, they're, that they're aware of the type of drugs used, to really ensure uh, safe animal handling and having the proper staffing of facilities, to provide readily accessible shark container for disposal, to also provide needle and syringes with protected devices such as retractable needles or hinged or a syringe cap or needle free uh, uh, um, as well to really exercise precaution when using products of concern, especially for pregnant women, and encourage employees to report um, needle stick injuries and record events. For employee practices, uh, a couple reminders for them is, is just to make sure that they're restraining animals uh, appropriately or properly, to get help from co workers if they need it, to use uh, correct animal restraint techniques to not recap needles or use um, only needle or syringes with protective devices. Uh, don't put syringes in their mouth. Discard any bent needles. Um, don't carry needles or syringes in your pocket. Um, use approved um, sharps or needle disposal uh, containers. Avoid removing sharps from the uh, disposal container. Uh, ideally, use the one-hand uh, one hand scoop technique if you can and report all needs stick injuries uh, to management, and then also to be mindful and to slow down. So in summary, um, a, a couple, I just want to um, remind folks that, uh, you know, needle stick injuries are common. Um, actually, I think I've got my slides backwards here. I just want to remind, there are resources for, for this. Uh, one is a video uh, that we have both in Spanish and English and also some posters. Um, as Karen pointed out, that posters uh, are used mostly for reminding folks and actually are probably not the best way to change behavior. Uh, in summary, a couple of things just to uh, remind folks is that needle stick injuries uh, are common, uh, especially in, in agricultural settings, especially in swine settings, that there really are a limited number of documented cases in the literature, but some of these can be serious, and that there's a real need for us to be aware of the issue and also to take precautions. Um, and uh, I provide here my contact information if you have further questions. And what I'd like to do next is to, to build on this discussion and hand over uh, our conversation to Dr. Scanlon Daniels. So Scanlon, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, sir. Uh, it's 
As he said, my name is Scanlon Daniels, um, and I'm going to visit a little bit about my experiences with needle-free devices and pork production. And I wanted to thank everybody for being on the webinar today. I looked through the <clears throat> list of attendees, and we've got suppliers of vaccines and antimicrobials that are injected into pigs. We've got producers. We've got suppliers of injection devices. We've got processors, and we have retailers. So I think we've got a very good representation of the of the whole pork chain represented today. Today, and um, I'm really encouraged that that there's this many people with this kind of interest in in helping prevent broken needles in pork. So I'll be successful today if if you get a veterinarian's perspective on the topic, you understand some of the pros and cons of needle and needle-free injection. Uh, you understand some of the risks associated with alternative injection locations besides the neck. And I'll also be successful if finally you appreciate some of the factors that lead to the present presence of broken needles in pork. So in my talk, just to kind of summarize the outline, I'll, I'll review some of the background that was uh, also covered in the introduction at the beginning, pros and cons of injections by needles, and same pros and cons for needle-free devices. We'll talk about some injection site lesions, and then finally end up with some take-home points. So a little bit of background on myself. Um, I grew up in central Iowa on a ferret to finish family farm. We had a 1,000 sows uh, through the 80s and early 90s. And so um, I got a, a good perspective on pork production in that environment. Um, went to school at Iowa State. And after graduating with animal science and DVM degrees, uh, worked for Iowa Select Farms and then later uh, seaboard Foods in Guymon, Oklahoma. And then for the last 13 years, I've um, been an independent veterinary consultant um, in my business, Circle H Headquarters. And we provide veterinary service to swine, beef, and dairy producers. We have a diagnostic and food safety laboratory as part of our business. And I also do contract research for pharmaceutical companies. And so I want to start out with a little bit of survey, uh, a survey question or a series of survey questions for the audience. Um, if you would each um, answer the question on your screen, do you have experience with needle-free injection devices? And it's yes or no. I'll give, I'll pause for a moment to give you all a chance to answer that question. Okay, so here's our answers. We have about 40% that do have experience and 60% that don't have experience. So that's actually a little bit higher than what I would have expected. We'll go to the next question. Do you currently use needle-free injection devices? So this would be more oriented towards the producers, producer participants, participants, um, if you guys and gals would answer that question. I'll, I'll pause for a moment for to give you a chance to do that. So we have 6% that do currently use and 94% that don't. And I think that's probably a pretty solid number for the industry.
The next question is, have you experience with, has your experience with needle-free been positive or negative? So that would be for anybody that's had experience using needle-free devices. All right, so interesting distribution there. We've got about 10% that have had very positive experiences, 18% that are moderately positive, almost a quarter that's neutral, 40% moderately negative, and 10% strongly negative. So we got quite a few people that have had not that great experiences with needle-free injection. So I think that's good information to know and kind of that's where the industry is at today as far as uh, receptivity towards alternative injection strategies. So the reality is, is we do need to give pigs injections, vaccinations, we need vaccinations to prevent diseases where oral or intranasal vaccines don't exist or are not effective. We need antibiotics to treat disease, and our ju judicious use guidelines really lead us towards doing individual administration in lieu of feed or water administration to a whole group. And then we've got the aspect of time, and over my 20-year practice experience, I feel we're giving more injections per pig now than ever before. Mycoplasma, PERS, Circo, antibiotics to all pigs at strategic times when they're weaned or if there's a disease outbreak and, and an entire group needs to be treated. We're giving injections at younger ages. We're using better oil adjuvants, which as we talked about with the human safety factor is more tissue reactivity. And we've got better broad-spectrum antibiotics now than we've ever had before, like Exceed, Draxin, Batril, as examples, versus you know the old drugs, penicillin and oxytetracycline, that, that were more common when I was growing up. Injection by needle has been the traditional standby. And I think as an industry, detectable needle use adoption has been very good, except perhaps for the smallest gauge needles, the 20 by half inch. Injections by needle are relatively inexpensive, and it's, there's very intuitive use by farm labor. So it's something that we can give the equipment to somebody fairly new in a system or a farm, and they're able to give injections fairly quickly. But at the farm level, many times we take that good injection technique for granted. We know there's times where there's high turnover among the labor staff. Sometimes there's untrained, unskilled, or poorly managed employees resulting in poor restraint of pigs, inaccurate placement, pigs that miss injections, or, or just bad injections where incomplete uh, volume dose is given. I'd also submit that those same employee or human safety factors um, are, are, are part of that as well. So unskilled, untrained people are probably more at risk to cause injury to themselves as well as do a, do a bad job with the pigs. So injection by needle-free device is the alternative to needles. It is higher cost. It is more difficult to implement. The use is not as intuitive as it is with the syringe and needle. With the equipment that's on the market today, there's multiple different devices needed depending on the dose volume that you want to give and the characteristics of the injection given. Specifically, is it a solution or a suspension? And as we documented, with our survey question, there are undesirable 
producer experiences, and I would submit that some of those have been with devices that have come to market prematurely that haven't worked well in field situations. What's the science say about needle-free injections? The science says it's at least equal, if not superior, in some cases. With vaccinations, we get transdermal and intradermal administration. We know that targets dendritic cells, which are specialized in antigen presentation to the immune system. We also know that needle-free injection can be done and is being done on a large scale in a percentage of our industry. I want to transition now and let, talk a little bit about the injection site lesions in pork. And several years back, the Pork Board funded a study looking at injection site lesions and locations in sows and market hogs. And injection site lesions in market hogs were generally very low and were confined to the neck when they were observed. But injection site lesions in sows were commonly seen in the neck, and at that time, lesser frequency in the hip. And that goes back to a Canadian, uh, some Canadian experiences that were publicized by National Hog Farmer, um, where for a period of time, the industry, some of the industry was using hip injections. And because of this issue with injection site lesions uh, coming about in the hip, and that being a higher value cut of meat compared to the neck, that's since been discouraged, and I don't think there's very much hip injection being done currently. And certainly I would discourage anybody from from doing that based on what we saw in this study. So what are the take-home points, or how do we move the needle on this issue? Um, traceability in our industry is a huge factor. If there were incentive or a penalty for the producer that uh, created the broken needle in pork, there'd be a lot more incentive, I think, for people to do things differently. High labor turnover and unskilled workers has always been an opportunity. And for those of you that have had unfavorable experiences, I'd say that needle-free administration can and is being done on a large scale in some segments. And then as an industry, we need to help insulate ourselves from misguided recommendations like the hip injections that, that we talked about earlier. You know, one of the big things to help motivate, you know, things at the farm level is proper administration does affect the pig health and does impact producer profit profitability. It suggests that training, a training and auditing focus motivated by increasing vaccine and treatment efficacy could indirectly reduce the risk of broken needles. So this issue is more than not straightening bent needles and properly identifying pigs when a needle does break. You know, those are both, well, straightening bent needles would, would certainly uh, lead to broken needles being in pork, but identifying them is really happening after the problem's already been created. So by training and auditing, we should be able to do a better job eliminating the, the root cause of the issue. So I covered a little bit of my background and perspective, some of the pros and cons of injections by needle and needle-free devices. Talked a bit about injection site lesions, especially associated with alternative injection locations, and then covered take-home points. So with that, um, I'll turn it over to the next speaker. Thank you much, Dr. Daniels. Great presentation by all three uh, speakers today. And uh, with that, uh, let's move into the Q&A portion. We do have a few uh, questions already submitted, but keep them coming in. Um, in case we do not get to every question, uh, we will be 
answering them uh, in the follow-up of the uh, on the on demand, and uh, we have your emails, so we will answer the questions that way. So let's get right to it uh, with the Q and A. The first question here is. Uh, Retractable needle syringes were mentioned. Can you share some vendors' names uh, that offer this product? Also, do you have any preferences on the ones on the market now? Uh, this is Jeff Bender. I'm the one who actually mentioned the retractable um, uh, needles. Um, uh, no, I, I don't have a good vendor name or one that actually um, uh, that I can refer folks to, but I'd be glad to um, respond to that or provide some some ones that are, are available. The, the challenge, uh, the pros and cons uh, of that, again, are the cost associated with those retractable needles. Um, on the human side, they've been using retractable needles uh, for some time now, and actually the technology has really improved. But um, I'd be glad to uh, come up with some uh, potential names or vendors uh, for folks. Okay, next question. Are uh, needle-free devices safer for farm staff to administer than needle administration? Sure, this is Scanlon, and I'll, I'll help with that question. Um, I'd say in my experiences with needle-free injection devices, um, in general, I would say that they're safer, but they still can be used inappropriately. Um, and probably the most common scenario would be um, where people might try to test out the device um, against their hand um, and might have an accidental discharge, or if they're cradling the pig like against their midsection and giving an injection in the neck towards their body, um, if that pig moves, then they can have a an accidental discharge uh, into their person. So. Um, those are those can be serious situations, you know, especially if they're adjuvanted products like we talked about earlier. Um, so they're not immune to the injuries to the farm staff, but I think in general they probably are a little bit safer, um, just because people have to be more thoughtful uh, when they give injections with those devices. Uh, this this is Jeff, and and uh, just to build on on Scanlon's uh, uh, remarks, I, I I completely agree. And um, there is uh, there is literature that does talk about high pressure injection injuries, and so they do occur. And sometimes there might be even a small product, um, but again, it might depend a little bit on the adjuvant that is with that product. Okay. Does Karen uh, have any? Anything to add there, or do we move on to the next question? I think those guys have answered it very effectively. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, next question. Uh, it's a two-part question. Do physicians or healthcare providers know what to do if they see a needle stick injury in a worker, and what should workers tell their healthcare provider? Uh, I'll take a stab at that. Um, what's interesting uh, about uh, healthcare providers and their knowledge of these products is, is very limited. And so the answer probably is no, that they don't know what these products are. Uh, and so one of the, the key things to, to help our healthcare providers or physicians is to actually bring the product label, if you can, or the product bottle, if you can, uh, with uh, the individual or contact them, let them know. Uh, they can then contact the manufacturer or the, or the, the company to inquire a little bit about what the product is, or even sometimes poison control centers um, to give them guidance as to what should be done. Uh, but for the most part, uh, many of our healthcare providers are really unaware of these products or the potential risks that some of these products might have. Sorry, uh, going through questions here. Um, what are National Pork Board's next steps with the broken needle issue? Yeah, I guess I should answer that one. Um, so we, we're continuing with our process. Um, we're obviously going to be producing some more educational materials this next year. But on top of that, 
Um, over the next year, we have, we'll be meeting again with the, um, the different industry stakeholder groups. We'll be meeting in, uh, early in the year and probably again in the middle of the year to um, assess what we need to be doing and what other things we can be doing. And that includes things like, again, accurately determining the, the number that, of broken needles that we're getting through the process. We, we don't know that right now, so we're working right now to, um, to, to figure that out. Um, and then, of course, research. We want to direct some funds to some research that's going to provide some value in this area and really help producers and packers um, deal with this issue and prevent it going forward. So I hope, I would love to say, by the end of this year, we'll be doing nothing more because the needle issue will be resolved. But that might be wishful thinking. Okay. Uh a few times we heard uh, hip vaccinations uh, being mentioned, and this question relates to that. Are hip vaccinations a recommended practice? Can you repeat that question? Are hip vaccinations a recommended practice? So as a veterinarian, I would say no. And the main reason is, is, if there are abscesses form or injection site lesions form, it ends up being in an area that doesn't drain very well, <clears throat> so it doesn't heal or resolve very well. And then that injection lesion is also in a higher value cut of meat that if you think about the pig or the sow hanging on the rail, to trim that out, you have to be very aggressive, take out a large a large chunk of a high-value cut to prevent contamination on the lower parts of the carcass. Compared to the neck, uh, you can be a little bit more precise to get that, get that lesion removed um, without contaminating the rest of the carcass. So definitely would not recommend giving hip injections. Okay, thank you. Are broken needles a bigger problem in sows or in market hogs? Sure. So in, a, in that pork board funded study, we found that the number of injection site lesions in sows were a lot higher than they are in, in market pigs. And anecdotally, sow processors do report finding a lot more broken needles in sows than than what market hog processors do. And I think that's because, um, you know, inherently we're vaccinating a larger animal, so the physics of giving the injection are different in sows. A lot of times we're working in a stall or with a, an animal that's free access in a pen, so their range of mobility can be bigger relative to how our hands can move when we're giving the injection. Um, so I do think there are more broken needles in sows than there are in market hogs. Um, additionally, you know, in the sow plants, there's a lot more detection equipment, and a lot of that's because that pro more of that product is processed, so it's easier to run through metal detection or other equipment that can pick up on that. So um, I do think it's a bigger issue in sow plants, although they are probably better equipped to deal with it as well. Okay. Um, are injection site lesions more common with needle-free injections? That's a great question. Um, what I've seen with needle-free injections versus needle injections is a lot of the same criteria apply. So if you give a needle-free injection through wet or dirty skin, you're going to be more likely to have an injection site reaction or lesion. Um, in addition, I've seen where the higher the oil adjuvant level in the vaccine, um, with that higher dispersion with the needle-free injection, sometimes that can lead to more of a visible um, injection site lesion. So I'd say with needle-free administration, because it's dispersed so well, um, there probably is more 
reactivity or more obvious reactivity with the needle-free injection than there is with, with the needle. That'd be a good study to look at, though, because um, my experiences would be just observational. Any other observations to be offered by either one of the other presenters? Nothing from me. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, when a needle breaks, is it preferred to find and remove the needle at the farm or simply mark the animal and let the processor find and remove the needle? So when I've, when I've worked with producers that have broken needles, I think it's preferred to try to, if you can identify the pig and get the needle out, that's obviously the best. I would tell you that, yeah, I would that the, Go ahead. the number of times we do find it is probably not very often. So, um, And then the second part would be if it's just a single pig, the, the processors that we've talked to would rather would rather not receive that pig into the plant. And so usually that is an individual discussion with your customer about what to do with that pig once it's identified. Go ahead, Karen. Yeah, I was just going to add that last point as well. I mean, it's really important that communication piece is the key part of this. If you have a system, if you've identified an animal with a broken needle, you must communicate with your packer. And if they don't want it, don't send it. Um, you know, it's, it's pretty key. That's where the, the system can fall down very easily um, if we think that it's okay to send an animal to the packing plant. And ideally, perhaps it might be better to just euthanize that animal on the farm rather than let it get it, potentially get into the, the food system. So, yes, please, yeah, <laughs> I would concur with what you're saying, Gannon. Okay, that looks like it wraps up all the questions that we have. Um, uh, and we're nearing the hour time that we've asked uh, you to take out of your day. So I'd like to thank our speakers, Karen Hoare, Dr. Jeff Bender, and Dr. C. Scanlon Daniels for an outstanding presentation. We would also like to thank the National Pork Board for making today's webinar possible. As a reminder, you will receive a follow-up email that will include a link to view a recording of today's presentation. So if you found this event useful, please share it with your colleagues. Once you leave the event, a short survey will pop up in your browser window. We'd appreciate it if you would share your feedback on this event as it helps us to provide you with content most interesting for you. On behalf of National Hog Farmer, have a productive remainder of the day.